My name is Sean, and my wife is Michelle. We're the lead pastors here at Kingdom Culture, and we're not able to be with you. We're away at a leaders uh, a leaders event uh, in the U.S. It's so excited about what's happening. God is raising up uh, an incredible, incredible group of people that are really seeing transformation in their uh, sphere, and that's what we're a part of down there. And so we're not able to be with you, but hey, we're excited because Joe is bringing the word this morning. You all know Joe. He's my favorite Ethiopian. He's part of our team here, leads the community part of what we do, the pastoral care part of what we do. He's amazing. I know he's got an amazing word for you this morning, so open up your heart, open up your mind, and let's welcome Joe to the platform. Joe, it's going to be awesome. You got this man. God's going to use you this morning to do amazing things in the lives of the people. In Jesus' name, Kingdom Culture, we'll see you next week. You're clapping now, but I hope you'll be doing that too at the end of the message. Uh, just, uh, I just want to tell you, you know, I, I'm just sitting there just worshiping God, and uh, I just felt this love. And uh, and I actually, Matt's sitting there. I just looked at him. I said, man, I love you. I did. I, I, that, that's, that's, our, our, our worship pastor is like laughing. The service is going sideways really quickly. <laughs> but I just felt the, the love of the Father. You know, when you feel the affirmation of heaven, you can't help yourself but love others. You know what I mean? And, and that's the whole reason why we do. So when you worship you know, you, you probably saw some of us being a little radical. You probably saw me thinking, who's that skinny guy going crazy over there? I, I, I'm just really so grateful because I know where I've come from. And without Jesus, I'd have been pretty self-destructive and I'd probably be dead today. And so the life that I have is in him. And, and I'm so grateful that he chose me, that he predestined me for greatness and success and uh, I just want you to know you know what we do here at Kingdom Culture it's really that it's to introduce you to this Jesus that can utterly transform your life for the better you think you've got a great life right now you think you're living the good life but I want to tell you if you don't know Christ you're only living a measure of your your destiny you really haven't encountered your purpose you know, the Bible talks in, 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 in Proverbs, it says many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the God's plan that will prevail. And it, it's God's plan that will frustrate your plans because his plan is so much more greater. So when you include him into your plans, God, what happens is he includes you into his plan. And the plan that he has for you has already been predetermined. And the, de the t predetermined destination is success. It's influence. It's not for you just to live in abject poverty, just to exist so that you can sustain a life so that you can retire in Florida when you're 65. No, no, no. He wants you to leave a legacy of faith that will echo throughout history. That is the kind of God that we serve. That is why I'm so excited because I know that in him I find my purpose in him I find my myself in him I find my lane in him I find my destination and so therefore for me to live is Christ and to die is gain wow that is why Paul said that it's because it is the life that I live right now every part of it every minute of it every second of it is surrender to God and when it's surrender to God guess what happens good things happen and the challenge for all of us is to surrender. I was sitting there, I was just meditating and asking God, what is the word that you want to release today? What is the word that you want to release today? And I kept hearing this, and I said, God said this, and I didn't obey last service, but I'm going to obey now. <laughs> I, I, I just, you know, sometimes we have a battle, and my battle is this. I want to be really transparent with you. I, I want to seem incredibly intellectual. So sometimes I prepare these mass messages that are, that they're like these big dissertations. They're these, these and, and I'm thinking, how am I even going to deliver this? And part of it is this part of me, the intellectual side of me that says, you know what? I got in me what they need, so I'm going to give it to them in a way that's eloquent. And they're going to go, woo! And God's like, no, 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 just obey me. I've got it. And so I just got to surrender. And this is it. This is the problem. The problem that we as mankind face day in, day out. I got to stay within this uh, boundary line that the, the guy has created for me. He's never done that for Pastor Sean. But 
but because I'm black, he's, he's made a decision. That I, and he's probably sitting there thinking, no, no, that's not the reason. I know your reason, brother. We'll pray for you after. But, so I am in jail, just so you know. So if, if, you, if you see me literally go over here, just yell at me and say, get back in. Um, and I told uh, uh, Matthew here, I said, I'm going to include it in, in my message. And my message is this, is that the, there is a boundary that God has created over your life. And the boundary is freedom. And it's good. Sometimes we think the boundaries that God has set for us are, are, are restraining us or keeping us from the things that we really want. But actually, God knows your capacity and your ability. And so he's like, in this season, brother, I want you to stay within this confine because that's what your season is. This is what you can handle. Don't worry. I'm training you. I'll increase it for you as you grow in me. And so sometimes what we're doing is we're prematurely trying to enter into bigger areas and we can't handle it because we've not learned how to store the little that we have. So how could God give you the big that you want? God wants you to store the little. So you want a big house, store your little house. If you can't store it, what, what do you think is going to happen when you get the bigger house? You ain't going to clean it. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. It, it, it's it's going to be actually a nuisance. You're going to be like, God, send me back to my little house. At least I can, you know, store that and clean it. Or send me somebody that can clean the house. I don't know. But the point is this, is that God wants to save us from ourselves. The greatest challenge that you will have in your life is not the devil, is not people, it's you. Jesus came to save you from you. For some, that's a revelation. They're sitting there going, what do you mean? I'm the problem? I thought it was like everyone, well, no, you're the problem. That's why it, the way God deals with this is, this, he, he, it's really simple. He says, deny yourself and carry your cross and then follow me. To deny yourself is the hardest thing to do because we all want to be in control. We want to be gods. That is the original sin. The original sin, what was presented to Adam and, and King, <laughs> Adam and Eve, was the fact that they could be like God. And so that's our struggle day in, day out. Your struggle is not your circumstance. It's not your situation. Stop getting mad at white people if you're black. I learned that a long time ago. I used to be pretty mad at you guys. Then I married, you know, God said, no, you're going to marry a white person. And, and <laughs> I used to be mad at, the, you know, at the, the Quebecois for a while. And, and God said, I'll give you a wife who's French. Uh, so now I've learned not, I'm not only, you know, part of the community of the Quebecois, but I'm in the family of the Quebecois. So free Quebec. I've said this to a lot of people. I said, I, I, if the Bloc Quebecois were going to, like, you know, run an election, I wouldn't mind being the first Anglo to, you know, run for party leadership. You know, I, I may not speak any French, but it's okay. <laughs> I'm from Quebec. The point is this, is that when you realize that the problem is you, suddenly you're able to have the freedom to live the life that call, God's called you. The devil, this is a trick. He wants to lie and deceive you. He wants to make you think that it's others. It's your situation. It's your circumstance. So this is what we have. We have a world of individuals that are blaming each other for their circumstances. But the issue is this, is that you can't handle your life. You cannot. You don't have the capacity nor the ability. God did not create you to handle your life. God created you to be in relationship with him so that he can handle your life. So what's your message today? <laughs> you can't handle your life. I changed my title. Pastor Sean was saying, like, dude, you always change your title. So are, is this it? I'm going to send it to Josh. Is this it? I said, no, no, I'm staying there. Today's message is really simple, is that I believe God has the capacity to help you break free from your addictions. I believe that something happened 2,000 years that changed your destination and your destiny. And that today you're going to come with an, to, with an, to an encounter with the reality of heaven. When we preach here at Kingdom Culture, 
We're not simply releasing words. What we do is this, is that when we, this is a, a kingdom principle, is that when we come into agreement with the reality of what is in heaven, which is invisible, which none of us can see, but something happens, there's a demonstration and there's a display. And I believe today you will see a demonstration of heaven, not only around you, but in your life. Because I believe God has broken the bad in you 2,000 years, but you just need to catch up to the reality of what has already happened. Because your attention has been on all the wrong things. You've been battling, you've been fighting for your freedom. You know, there's a story during World War II uh, there was a, a group of people that were fighting in Japan for years and uh, the war. And they were in an isolated part of, of Japan. And uh, they, the war was over. The, the war was finished. You know, the, Japan surrendered. And, uh, but no one told them that the war was over. So for years, they lived as if they were in a war. And I was thinking about that. This is a picture of so many people's lives. That the war is over, but because of lack of knowledge, because of understanding, and that's what the Bible says, for lack of understanding, for lack of vision, the people perish. The people literally, just out of ignorance, battle an enemy that's not there. And I'm telling you this right now. The enemy that you're fighting with is not the devil, but you. Because the Bible is really interesting. It says that when Jesus had died, that what happened to the devil, that he was rendered powerless. He has no power over you except the power that you give him. And the only power that he has over you is his ability to lie to you or deceive you. So when you give attention to his lies, then he then has authority. So this is a thing that a lot of people don't understand. Jesus has already given you the authority to live the life that you want. God has given you the ability to create the world that you want. But so many of us, what we think is that we've become victims to circumstance. And so therefore, we're just waiting for somebody to rescue you. But biblically, this is what I want to tell you. And this is going to be important for some of you. God does not rescue you. He provides his power and authority in your circumstance and situation because he believes in you. God is not into rescuing because he already rescued you 2,000 years ago in his son, Jesus Christ. So what do you think he's doing? He's running around trying to rescue people? No, he's saying to them, look, I'm going to give you the divine empowerment of heaven to do what you cannot do by your own ability. And that's what we call grace. Grace is undeserved, unmerited favor of God. When that comes over your life, you do things that you never thought you would ever do. And I am a sign of that. How did I go? 1999, I was drug addicted, hopeless, had overdosed. To now, I don't know how many years there are, but I'm not good in math. What are we, 2016? I don't even know what year we're in. Like, it could be, yeah, 15 years? No, it's long. You're horrible at math. 99, 99, 16. Yeah, yeah, that's 15, 16. That's, that's give or take, <laughs> plus or minus. <laughs> but 16 years later, you know, God has, like, totally restored me to the point that I do not even recognize the person that I used to be. Is that wild? That you can stand there and you think, like, if someone told me about this Joe that existed in 1999, I'd be like, oh, poor dude. Like, I need to give him a hug. <laughs> he don't know who he is. He don't know his identity. He's got a lot of religion in him. He's got lots of knowledge, but he doesn't have a relationship. And what I'm going to tell you this is that God is here so that you can have a relationship with him. God wants to restore you into your right standing. You should be excited because God is here. How many believe God is here right now? How many feel the tangible presence of God right here? I feel like I need to minister you guys like I used to minister on the streets, you know. For years uh, with Pastor Sean, we started this whole thing basically on just doing street ministry. After God literally like intervened in my life. Because in 1999, I overdosed on ecstasy, and I was at the end of myself, and I came back home totally, like, just, like, I mean, you're talking about a person being humbled. I was humbled. 
I was at the lowest point of my life, and I had to spend a very long period of time just isolated in my home, depressed, living in, in regret, you know, drinking the, 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 the consequence of, of my decisions and, and not knowing that there was a solution. And so what I did was I just went from, you know, I would go to church seven days a week hoping that if I just stayed within the confines of the church that somehow God would heal me. I served my whatever off, because I can't use that word here because that's not, that's not godly. Um, I have another thing I like to say, but that's also not godly. So <laughs> I have a lot of ungodly things to say sometimes. <laughs> but they're funny. Somebody said to me earlier, it's a good, uh, good, good, good preaching last service, but uh, there's some stuff that you said a little weird, like about that whole nakedness covering thing. It's like, stay off that. And I'm like, that's the worst thing to say to me because now I'm going to actually go and delve into it even deeper. So <laughs> you, you, you wait for that, okay? It's coming. It's coming, but you, it's, it's exciting part. Actually, I've got more. <laughs> I can't wait to share more of it. I just thought, oh, God, Lord, thank you. Uh, someone change my lock on my thing. So we're going to do a timeout. Well, no, we won't do a timeout. I can do two things. How many guys can actually have the capacity to multitask? I'm a horrible multitasker. I, I just don't know. Never. Okay. So now we'll never lock. So I, I haven't used my notes yet. So it's not like I need them, but hopefully we'll use them eventually. How many want to stay here all afternoon? That's good. Okay, that's good because I'm incredibly long-winded, and I was thinking about this. I thought it'd be awesome if we did a three-hour service. <laughs> uh, no, we won't. This is going to end before it's painless. It's quick. Um, <laughs> I, I just feel the, the the goodness of God, and I just want you. You know, sometimes we can preach great sermons and miss God, I, and I felt that in this in the first service. I want to be honest with you. I, I felt. I didn't feel the unction of the Spirit of God. And I thought, oh, God. Like, I, I, and I know that when I feel that. And so I thought, God, you know, you'll use anything. But right now, what I want to do is I just want to invite people into an encounter with God. And as I was saying, it, like when this ministry started, that's what it really started with. It was just Pastor Sean encountered God in his room. And he thought, well, if I can encounter him in my room, then others should be able to. And so he just began to go out on the streets. And so I met him in 2004 desperate because I was going through another cycle. Yeah, how many been in these cycles of uh, patterns where you're like, you, you, you find hope and you're like, okay, finally, this is it. And all of a sudden, the old demons start coming. And you can feel them, you know, you, you know, it's, it's, it's like it's hopeless almost. It's like it, it, you just, you're just like paralyzed by this idea and you're thinking, not again. Not again. And I was in that cycle again, you know, after 99, having overdose and then coming back and then being, in, you know, involved in ministry and relapsing back three times. I was like, man, this is hopeless. I can't do this anymore. So I was at a point where I was literally giving up on God. I was just ready to just say, God, you know what? I've had enough. But I was, you know, I was dating this girl who happened to be white also. Um, <laughs> I just thought I introduced you to that. Just for your amusement part. Like, just, that's sort of, but uh, I, I, I met this girl, and uh, we were attending the same church. And, and she told me about this guy, Sean, who was sending out all these emails about people being delivered of demonic oppression and healing and uh, like supernatural stuff. And I didn't believe a thing he was writing. And so I thought, okay, well, I'll go because I'm invited. And um, I, I, I went in there really to test them. I was like, I'm going to give him some, you know, theological, deep theological questions to see if he can answer these things kind of thing. So I heard his speech, uh, his testimony, and at the end of the thing, I don't know why I did this, but I went up to him and I was like, dude, like, I didn't use words like that. I was more Ebonics. I'm like, yo. <laughs> I, I still wasn't the hipster thing. wasn't like, you know, into my, in me yet. Dude was weird, like the fact that I was like, dude, everybody's like, dude, 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 dude. Now I say it all the time. Um, but at the time, I was like, yo, I'm like, uh, can I, like, meet with you to talk? And he's like, well, you know, I'm leaving, like, Tuesday. Like, the only time I can meet you is Monday night. So come to my house. And so th check this out. I don't know the guy. He invites me to his house, and he's wearing, he's got these crazy dreads, and he's got all these piercings and stuff like that. He, he was like, you know, he, he looked really rough and tumble, but it's all right. And I was like this, you know, supposedly well-educated, postmodern Christian that was ready to kind of call it quits. And so, okay, I'll, I'll go. 
So I show up to his house, and, and, and the whole time I was asking myself, okay, what are the questions I'm going to ask him? So I had a list of things to ask him, and I, I get there, and uh, we're at his mom's home, and she's not here right now, but uh, she didn't know me. And uh, we're sitting in, in the kitchen, and before I could say anything, Pastor Sean goes, can I pray for you? And I'm like, yeah, okay, that's cool. You can pray for me. And uh, all of a sudden, he lays hands on me, and he begins to pray. And I feel something for the first time in my life. I'd gone to Bible school. I studied the Bible. I'd never experienced anything like that. I'd experienced it getting high. Oh, did I ever? Like ecstasy. Like, those are like pretty good stuff. <laughs> I remember. I, I won't tell you this, but well, I, why not? I'll, I'll entertain you. <laughs> but uh, why not? <laughs> Pastor Son, don't go too deep. I'm like, whatever. My, my gifting is... Like, all of us are gifted a certain way. My gifting is vulnerability. <laughs> I just don't know what to, I just tell, I'll tell you everything. I really don't care what you think, your opinion of me. It's like, whatever, you got more issues than I do, so I know. So I'm like, <laughs> whatever, I'll, I'll just share. So, um, yeah, when, when the first time I ever did a hit of ecstasy, uh, I was living in Toronto, and uh, I was working for, uh, for uh, Rogers Communication. I had a great job. But I was living in a, in a frat house. I was in attendance school, and I was living in a frat house. It just shows you the kind of lifestyle I was leading. And uh, the guy that was responsible for cleaning the whole house, whatever, him and I hung out a lot. And uh, so one day he was cleaning. He's always high. Like, he smoked up 24-7, so that's how he cleaned. He didn't do a great job, obviously, because he was high. Um, and so I was just hanging out, drinking beer, whatever. And, and then one day he's like, hey, dude, he's like, you want to take, like, a head of E? And I was like, no, no, dude, I don't do any of that stuff, whatever. He's like, no, 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 you love it, whatever. So we go outside, and they had these couches set up in the lawn. And uh, I, it's, it's just, that's the lifestyle they lived. They, they drank beer, and, they, you know, that frat house lifestyle. And so and I'm, I'm working and living with these people. And so I sit down, and uh, I said, okay, well, I can't take the whole. I'll take a half. And so I take half of this thing, and, you know, whatever, how long, take, all of a sudden, I'm feeling this bliss, this joy. And I'm like, oh, my feet, like, they, they're hot. So I take my shoes off and we're sitting there for hours. I don't even know this. And we ended up walking bare feet all the way downtown and played video games for, like, hours. I had no clue what I did. But that was my initial introduction to this world of drugs. And when I entered that world, I thought, this is what I've been looking for all my life, ecstasy, an experience, a tangible experience, and I felt this love that was over the top, I felt emotions, I didn't care what people thought, and I thought, this is it, I, I found it, I found God in a pill, but then fast forward 1999, because this God was actually a master that enslaved me, and that literally almost killed me, I come to a place where now, I'm needing another hit. That's what was happening to me. As, as, as an addict, what I was looking for is I was looking for an experience because I was designed for pleasure. And so part of me is like, so when we look at addicts, a lot of times we judge them. We think, oh, but addicts actually are very prophetic to our generation. Because what they're saying is this, is that we're all actually created to experience a high. A, a type of high that totally... It's, it's, it's the, the, the kind of existence that uh, Adam and Eve had. The, the Bible says that the Garden of Eden was called fenced in pleasure. They had this relationship with God where they had no knowledge of sin, no knowledge of shortcomings. They didn't, never felt judged. Some of you are sitting here probably thinking like, you know, is this person judging me? Is this, uh, you're feeling secure? All that. There's nothing. They're just in perfect relationship with God. So there was a part of me that was desiring it. And so when Pastor Sean preached uh, not preached, <laughs> prayed for me, I literally felt pleasure. And I felt a pleasure that I could not even hold. And I started to, I went from being despondent, hopeless, to suddenly finding purpose. And I'm like going, what's going on? And I'm starting laughing. And I remember looking at him and telling him, this is, this is so much better than the drugs that I used to take. I, I just feel like there's a part of me that's feeling, but I don't know what's going on, but it's just so good. And he just kept praying. And I was high literally that whole evening. 
I, he was asking me to write my email. I couldn't write my email because I, I, I just wasn't capable. And I was the in, under the influence of heaven. God was telling me that he was a real tangible God, that he was visible, that he was willing to come and meet me. And the part about God is this, is that, the, 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 you know, Pastor Sean, he says this, there's no high, like, the, you know, the God kind of high. The reason being is this, is because the next morning when you wake up, you don't feel guilty, you don't feel shame, you just feel happy. I just want to sing I'm happy right now, but I won't. <laughs> Clap your hands. <laughs> That's what happened to me. That's what changed my life. And I, I'm, this is what I'm trying to tell you today, is that you can also experience that same experience that I experienced God right now because God is no respecter of persons he will meet any person at any point in any situation you're not too far off from God actually the people that think they're the furthest from God are the closest to God that's why the addicts in our culture are the ones who are prophetic to us because they know something they're tired of the boredom they're tired of living this mundane life. A lot of times people will come to church because it's more like, you know, I just, I've done my duty. I feel good. That's what church has become. But church is not supposed to be this. Church is a supernatural place. It's a place where you encounter things that, you're, that wow you. You should always be coming to church thinking, woo! <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's supposed to be something where you actually experience the love and affirmation of God. Well, the title of my message is, I Can Live Free, <laughs> Breaking Bad. <laughs> I love it. I love the title. Let's read uh, <laughs> some scripture because I could just talk forever and that's not good. John 8, 34, 38. Jesus said, I, I tell you most solemnly that anyone who chooses a life of sin is trapped in a dead end life and is in fact a slave. That's the important word. A slave is transient who can't come and go at will. The son, though, has an established position, the run of the house. So if the son sets you free, you are free through and through. I know you are Abraham's descendants, but I also know that you're trying to kill me because of my message, because my message has not yet penetrated your thick skulls. I'm talking about things I've seen while keeping company with the father, and you just go on doing what you've heard from your father. Some hard stuff that God has said. John 8, 36, didn't amplify, just so that we can amplify that passage. So if the Son makes you free, then you are unquestionably free. Unquestionably. There is no doubt that you're free. If God did it, then you're free. But the question is this. Do you believe it? That's the challenge. The challenge is this, is that God may say that, and you may know that, but until you apply it in your life, it's not truth. Applied knowledge is the only thing that can transform your life. But when you truly believe this by faith and you apprehend that and you say, whom the, God, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And you never question that. Guess what you do? You go from living from this place to this place to this place. You're forever. The Bible says you go from glory to glory. You're constantly growing in God and that's God's heart but the question is this is this how can you be free and still be addicted how is it that so many of us know Jesus have a relationship with God but yet we're mastered by our addictions and I'm not even talking about drug addictions you could be addicted to numerous things addiction simply my definition of addiction is this is that anything that you do apart from God is an addiction because what it is, it's, it's addiction is about what? It's about worship. When you look to it to fill a, a void in your life or a need in your life, then you have become a slave to that thing. So for some of you, it could be a relationship that you're addicted to a person, that you see that person and you can't let that person go. Like, I mean, like that person is your God, your hope, your everything. For some of you, it's bottled water. Actually true. They've done research. Some people are addicted to bottled water. I do not understand it, but who knows? You know, people are addicted to all sorts of things. The thing is this, that we can all potentially be addicted to all kinds of different things. It's actually staggering the list of things that you can be addicted to. Aggression, uh, applause, arson, attention, body, building, 
body modification, bottled water, carbohydrates, chat rooms, chewing gum, chili sauce, chocolate. I'm near addicted to chocolate here. No one's admitting now. It's like, no, I'm not master of anything. <laughs> Put your hand out in there. Cinnamon toothpicks. That's a weird. <laughs> cleaning. I want to meet that person who's addicted to cleaning. Clutter, collecting, credit cards, coupons, daydreaming, diuretics, email, exercise, food, gambling, gossip, Harry Potter, high fructose, corn syrup, hoarding, internet, junk food, laxatives, lip balm, love, lying, marathon running. That's a weird thing. Marathon running. I don't know how you can get it. But there's a high, I guess. I've never experienced it. But someone, uh, massive uh, online role-playing games, masturbation, messiness. There's a 12-step group for messy-holics. Americans are addicted to oil, according to George Bush. That's what he said. The nation is addicted to oil. Some of you are online auctions. Some of you just are addicted to shopping. You just don't got enough clothes. You just got to go. You know, you just keep on shopping. Some of you just can't stop. Some of you are addicted to over-the-counter nasal sprays. That's weird. Some of you have lots of money. Plastic surgery is just constantly, you know, improving. You're like, oh, that nose needs a little trimming here. Not that. Whatever. Relationships, religion, risky behaviors, role playing. Basically, what I'm saying to you is the list is endless. And in our society, to some extent, we've deemed everything as addiction. And the reason being is this is because it's important for us to label it so that we can somehow abdicate the responsibility. That it's no longer our problem. It's an addiction. I, have no, I can't do this anymore. Man, brother, you don't understand. It's a disease. Like, you know, like water bottles is a disease, man. I, I, I don't know. I, I just can't keep, help myself. And so what's happened is that we've literally put ourselves in a position where we feel hopeless about our situation. So when you feel hopeless, guess what you do? You just stay in your addiction. You just stay there because you've resigned yourself to this fact. But uh, I want to tell you something. First of all, you're not addicted permanently because in culture this is the three ways that we treat addiction one way is to simply say it's a choice dude you just gotta choose it's easy i do it every day the guy who's not addicted to anything it's like really easy look i do it every morning it's so hard i drink one beer and go home it's like but the point is this is that it's not always just the choice maybe the initial time that you made the decision to to take that whatever is a choice, but eventually what happens is that thing masters you, and then it literally robs you of your ability and your capacity. And with drugs, it actually changes your, the makeup of your brain structure. So now your brain is working against you. So you're hopeless. So th 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 there is a component that, yes, there is a decision, but it's not the whole truth. And the other element that we see in the medical community is to simply call it a disease. But the problem is this, is that there are many people who have been able to stop from their addictions. And so this, the, the, the challenge for it is that if it's, an, if it's a disease, then to some extent it's permanent. You can't do anything. It's like cancer kind of thing. It's like, well, I'm hopeless. But the point that I'm trying to tell you is that it's deeper than that. It is a disease to some people. If you've been in it for 20 years, you're physiologically, you're a different person. You don't even know the person that you've become. And so in many ways, it is a disease. It's a disease of the mind. But the Bible has a, a different answer to this. The Bible says this, that your addiction, and this is point one, is actually a consequence of sin. Jesus said in uh, John 8, 34, 38, I tell you most solemnly that anyone who chooses a life of sin is trapped in a dead-end life and is, in fact, a slave. A slave is transient who can't come and go at will. The son, though, has an established position, the run of the house. Here's the truth that I believe will set you free today. The addiction you're struggling with did not choose you. Rather, you chose it. Why? Because of a lie. The lie is this, is that addiction always presents itself as a solution. It's a temporary solution, but it presents it. In that moment, you're thinking, if I just cut, I'm going to feel better. That's what happens. And addiction says to you, well, if you just do this drug, then you can escape your situation. And so in many ways, for a lot of people, it is a solution to a miserable existence. 
Some people are living in, 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 in a reality that's so challenging. They've been abused and beat up. And so the drug is the only escape that they have. The cutting and the self-mutilation or whatever it is, the only thing that makes them feel alive. And so you need to have some compassion and understand that it is a lie. I'm not saying that they, they're just victims, but the, 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 what happens is that when you are in that state, when you're that vulnerable, then you'll believe anything because you're looking for a solution. This is why we used to go on the streets because we knew that the people that were the hungriest for God actually are the ones that seem the furthest from God. Always. I've learned that now. When I look at someone who's in a desperate situation, I'm thinking, this is a God moment. Because you know what? The guy who has it all together, well, he doesn't think he has a problem, so he's incredibly difficult. How can you tell him? Life is great, you know? I got a great job. I got a great car. I got this and this. He's living in, in self-righteousness. He's, and and self-righteousness is the hardest thing. That's why Jesus had such a hard time with the Pharisees. Because they thought they knew it all. With a person that knows it all, all you can say is like, see you later. There's got to be a point where they surrender and say, okay, God, like, they need to have an encounter with the love of God. And they need God to divinely, the spirit of God, to show them their, 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 their despair and their actual situation. So what I mean when I say you choose it? Well, I believe this is, this, is that we choose it to cover something. And it's to cover the nakedness that we're feeling. The shame and guilt. Every one of us is born an addict. Ooh. Every one of us is born into sin. This idea that you were like, you know, you hear songs that you're born uh, free. You're not born free. You're actually born in prison because of what happened to Adam and Eve. And so what happens is, and this is what we do. Oh, look at culture. Everything that you see in society, it's a reaction to feeling unloved. And it's, it's always self-medicating in some form. Whether it's the guy who's climbing the, the heights of, of, of corporate America or corporate Canada or the guy who is an entertainer, all of, us are, all of them are to some extent trying to find some peace. The Bible um, defines sin. And a lot of times we've done a really horrible job of defining sin. We're good at defining sin as a moral issue. We talk about it and it's, that's one element of it. There's, a, there's an aspect of it. There's a, a consequence to it. But if you really look at the, the Hebrew on it, it's really simple, actually. It means to miss the mark, and also it means to be without a share in. So when Adam and Eve sinned, what happened to them is for the first time in their life, they weren't good enough. And for the first time in their life, they lost their inheritance, which was God himself. Essentially, sin is always reminding us of our shortcomings, and it separates us from our purpose. A lot of times, the reason why people are wandering uh, the streets and, or the, the various corridors of, of school here or ever aimlessly is because they have lost their purpose. Recently, I was reading an article, and the writer states that we are way more well acquainted with our shortcomings than our strengths. If you ask anybody, They'll tell you their weaknesses. It's so simple. Ask them what they're good at. I've done this. After pastoring for almost eight years now, I see it every time. I sit somebody down and I say, what are you good at? And they're like, um, uh, well, um, and sometimes they're embarrassed to even say that they're good at. But immediately what I say to them, it's like, okay, what are your weaknesses? Oh, I'm not good at this, I can do this, and this, and this, and this. Because we're constantly disqualifying ourselves because there's something in us that says you're not good enough. And that is part of the byproduct of what happened to Adam and Eve. We live in a world which people are held in bondage by sin. All addiction is a response to sin. Addiction then is an external response to a spiritual struggle. The only thing that is capable then of covering up your nakedness is the blood of Christ. And let's read Genesis 3, 4, 13 in the NLT. The serpent told the woman, you won't die. God knows that the moment you eat from the tree, you will see what's really going on. You'll just be like God knowing everything ranging all the way from good to evil. When the woman saw that the tree looked like a good eating and realized what she would get out of it, she would know everything. She took and ate the fruit, and they gave some to her husband. Darn it. And he ate it. Because no husband says no to their wife. 
immediately the two of them did see what's really going on. So what did they see? What was presented to them was like, you're going to be God like God. But this is what they ended up seeing because they couldn't handle being God. They saw themselves naked. They sewed fig leaves together as a makeshift clothes for themselves. When they heard the sound of God strolling in the garden in the evening breeze, the man and his wife hid in the trees of the garden, hid from God. God called the men, where are you? He said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid. God said, who told you you were naked? Did you eat from that tree? The man said, the woman gave me as a companion. She gave me fruit. From the tree, and yes, I ate it. God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? The serpent seduced me, she said, and I ate it. That's the line. The serpent seduced me, and I ate it. It's the lie that people believe. The addiction is always presented as a solution. And when you partake of it, what it does is it literally strips you naked. And all you see is your shame and your guilt. And you feel hopeless. And so what happens then is you get into the cycle of sin. Because when you feel hopeless and naked, what do you do? You go back to the drug, hoping that it will cover you. Because we have what I would call amnesia. We forget. I've done that a thousand times probably. I would have a binge and after three weeks or whatever, I say to myself, I will never do this because it's caused me so much pain. But then all of a sudden, I'm back again and I'm thinking, how did I do that? It's because it's always presenting itself as a solution. Until you see the real, until you actually encounter with the real, you will always go for the counterfeit. And the devil is always good. He'll always, always seduce you. He'll always present it. He'll always say, oh, just a little one, just a little bite. But that's the very thing that will strip you naked. That they were naked. This is the Matthew Henry. This is, this is that they were stripped, deprived of all honor and joys of their paradise state and exposed to all the miseries that might justly be expected from an angry God. Once you lose your relationship with God, you go into deception and you begin to see God from a completely different angle. All of a sudden now, you have to perform for this God because he is literally a God that's out to get you. And God knew this. God knew this. And he said, look, you know, I can't do this. We can't have this relationship because God could not deal with sin because there, God is without sin. And so he immediately, in that moment of their nakedness, he begins the process of restoring them. And this is what he does in Genesis 3.21. God made leather clothing for Adam and his wife and dressed them up. You see, the, the, the fig leaves that they were using were just weren't enough. What you produce by your own merit, by your own effort, will never cover you. But what God gives you will cover you. It will cover your nakedness and your shame. And will restore you into a rightful relationship with him. It was a prophetic picture of what Jesus was going to do. That Jesus was literally our covering. Jesus was going to come years later to restore them back into a right state. That is the message of the gospel. The gospel is good news. That Jesus has come to restore you into a state of paradise. Into a state of bliss. Into a place of fenced in pleasure. That is the purpose of the gospel. Not for you to be a slave. So many of us have presented the gospel as such, but that's not the truth. I don't have not preached my points, but I think this is so much better. Today I have good news for you. God wants to reestablish you. But the way God reestablishes you is really interesting. He kills you. He kills who you are. You're all self, all of your issues, all your stuff. He deals with that. Literally, that's what the picture is. Is When Jesus died on the cross, it's as if you were also dying. Because he was our substitution. Because we weren't capable of paying the penalty of sin. Because the penalty of sin demanded a perfect sacrifice. And none of us were perfect enough. Because that's the kind of God that we serve. So God says this. He says, you know what? You, none of you, all the commandments, everything that you've done, all it's done is frustrate you. And, and it allowed you to know how, how, how horrible you are. Because that's what the law is for. The law is supposed, to, is supposed to push us towards God. It's supposed to remind you that every time you try to obey the Ten commandments and you're like man I can't do it if God is saying to you yes I know 
the law was introduced as a guardian. It was temporary. The picture is this, is that the Israelites were enslaved to the law. Because ultimately, God wanted them to bring them into a place of maturity so that they can inherit all that he had. That's the story of the, the whole idea why they spent 40 years in the desert. The reason being is because God was waiting for them to be mature enough to apprehend their inheritance. I have a son. Well, I have two sons and a daughter. But all of them, they're toddlers. They're really small right now. They have the right to everything that I own. I don't own a lot, but they have the right to everything. And one day, I will write a will, and I will give it to them. But they right now don't have the ability nor the capacity to store it. So just because, this is a lot of people's relationship with God. They're in the kingdom. They have a relationship with God. But because they're not mature, God has to wait for them. Because once you become a son, the only person that can inherit the gift of God is a son. Not a slave. If you have a slave mindset, you will never come into all that God has for you. So the maturing is this, is you believe in God and saying, yes, I am a son and a daughter. When you become that, a transaction happens and you begin to inherit everything that Jesus died for. Do you get this? When you access that, guess what happens to you? You're no longer enslaved to the things that you're supposed to master. You become a master over the very things that used to master you. You can read this in Galatians. That's the picture that Paul's drawn to the church of Galatia. He's saying to them, oh, you foolish Galatians. What are you doing? Why are you being mastered by the law? Jesus died for you so that he can free you. You're no longer, you no longer have to operate from this law perspective. Because the law will always do this. It will always remind you how deficient you are. You make a decision today and you say to yourself, okay, today I'm going to do A, B, and C. Guess what happens the next day? You break it. Because you don't have the capacity. But your prayer should be this. Today I'm going to believe God. I'm going to work it through me. But it's going to be worked out in Him. Every promise, every dream that you have, you surrender to Him. Your addiction right now, it's just simply this, is your cry for heaven. You're crying for heaven. You're crying for your father. And God is saying, I'm here. I'm here for you. I'm here. I want to receive you. How many of you have heard the story of the prodigal son? And I'll finish with this. How many of you have heard the story of the prodigal son? You know, the story of the prodigal son is really this. It's a picture of what happens when God restores you. The prodigal came to God and he said, not to his father, and he said this to him. He said, I want everything that belongs to me, my inheritance. Give me half of my inheritance. And so the father gave it to him. And he went on and squandered it, living wildly. He finds himself in a condition where he's living with the pigs. And he's actually eating the very thing that the pigs are eating. Imagine this. He, this guy was established in the house. He had the run of the house. He had all the, 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 the trappings of the wealth that his father carried. But because he wanted to live his life by his own volition, by his own ability, he put himself in a position where he not only squandered his wealth, but now he's living worse than a slave. So he comes to his senses in a moment and he says this. He says to himself, you know what? I can live a better life as a slave in my father's house than myself. So what he does is he goes, I'm going to go back and, and, and repent and beg my father and ask him to just restore me, not even as a son, but to restore me as a slave. And the story goes that the, as the son was coming, far off the father saw him and the father ran towards his son and bear hugged him. And not only... He gave him the best clothes. He killed the best animal. They, they killed the calf. They threw the biggest party the community has ever seen because now the son that was lost has come back. 
You want to come back as a slave, but God wants you to restore you as a son and a daughter. When you come back to God, you're not coming back as some third rate whatever. You're coming back as the person that you used to be. God reestablishes you and reminds you of who you are. And all the issues, all the, the stuff of your past life, guess what? It's no longer there because he's completely separated you. The son did not repent because of the fear of the father. The son repented because of the love of the father. When you experience the love of God, you cannot help yourself but change your ways. And what I believe is this, and the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 5, 12, but onwards, he says, Paul says this, he says, for the love of God controls me, constrains me. When you experience the love of God, all your wild living, all your undisciplined ways all of a sudden change. What that word means control is this, the love of God channels you. The love of God creates a boundary of your life and it's called freedom. All you need is a divine encounter. And I'm believing today that you can have an encounter with this God. I don't care what your situation is. I don't even know how desperate your situation is. It's not important. What is important is the fact that you're here today and you want to meet this guy named Jesus. How many of you want to really live free today? How many of you really want to live your life in a way that is on purpose? That every morning you wake up with the knowledge that you're qualified. Oh man, that is the, that is the antidote to every problem that people are struggling with in our world today. Did you know that? The antidote is the fact that you are no longer a sinner. But a son or a daughter. Addiction can be broken. John 8, 36, 36 said it. That's the last point that I have so for the guys that are doing it. So if the son makes you free, then you are unquestionably free. This passage is telling us that what Christ has done on our behalf can be, cannot be undone by our addiction. It doesn't matter how strong your addiction is, it's not stronger than the blood of Christ. Jesus has set us free from the bondage of sin and we're no longer we no longer have to measure ourselves on our ability or right standing with God, but His right standing with God. Everything you do now is based on what He's done for you. If we simply put our faith into this truth, then we will unquestionably live free. The bad in us has been broken. Sin is powerless to separate us from a relationship with God. The fact is, if you've been set free, then now you have the responsibility of living free. Don't be like those Japanese living a war or fighting a war that don't exist. Don't go home and start, don't worry, those, the, 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 not all Japanese, you know what I meant. This is the thing, you know this by fact now, but I want you to know it by experience. How many want to know it by experience? Because when you experience it, it bypasses your intellectual capacity. It is the Spirit of God that enters in you. And all of a sudden, you're doing something. You're under the influence of heaven. You've now surrendered yourself. And you said, all that I know, I don't know. So God, I just want you. And the Bible is very clear. It is the, 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 the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. It's when you experience the kindness of God and the beauty of God, when you know how incredible He is, when you know that He is for you, not against you, is when all of a sudden you begin to change. I want to encourage you before you leave today. God has already judged humanity in His Son. He no longer has to judge humanity. When Jesus died on the cross, the Bible tells us that Jesus actually became a substitute for us. It's as if you were there, as if you were the one who paid the penalty of sin. You no longer have to hide your shortcomings, guilt and shame. Just bring it all before the feet of Jesus and he will reestablish you as a son or daughter. Everything that we are apart, that is apart from him, good or bad, is no longer taken into account. Everything, everything, 
only his doing. The only thing that matters is anything that Christ, that's all God sees. So this is what happens is that when you come into a relationship with God, all he sees is all the good in you because Christ, who is good, is inside of you. Christ's payment for our freedom was expensive. It was blood. It was the most expensive blood that you'll ever pay for. He became poor so that we can become rich. Like Paul, the life we live now is no longer ours, but it's hidden in him. I want you to stand up. I'm going to finish off with this passage. And I'm going to pray for you guys, and I'm going to believe. How many are really ready right now for an encounter from heaven? I'm, I'm believing this right now. Galatians 2.22 in the NLT, this is what it says. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by, the, by trusting the God, the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Simply that. The life that you live now is not yours. The life that you live now is not your responsibility. You hear me? The life that you have right now is not up to you. It's up to him. I'm excited because guess what? I'm too skinny to do it all by myself. I'm not strong enough. I could do wait for the next 30 years. I just don't have the capacity to get myself where I need to do. So I surrender to this guy named Jesus who's more than capable to take me where I'm supposed to go. And I'm telling you, why don't you get on the train? Because this train is going somewhere and it's beautiful. Get on the train. How many want to get on the train?